Well, good evening, everyone. It's a very great privilege to chair this evening's talk, which marks the culmination of Professor Stuart Reynolds' near 10-year term as a convener for our science programme at the BRLSI. And it seems wholly fitting that as a past president of the Royal Entomological Society, Stuart's talk this evening is going to be on his favourite topic of insects. Indeed, the Faustian bargain of agriculture and how insects invented sustainable farming 50 million years before humans and how on earth they did it. Well, Stuart's talk could in fact have been on any one of a number of topics within the spectrum of biological sciences, such as his vast array of specialised expertise in physiology, biochemistry and molecular biology. Indeed, I must say that the BRLSI has been incredibly fortunate to benefit from Stuart's tenure as co-convener for the science alongside Professor John Davis, who together, they both drew on extensive academic contacts to deliver lectures here in Queen Square for well over a decade. So during this evening's talk, may I now remind everybody that this talk is being videoed and therefore I must ask you to mute your microphones now and to turn off your video. And may I also say at this point that if anybody wants to ask a question, you can click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen down in the centre. And then after Stuart's talk, we'll go over those questions and any others that you may wish to put to Stuart. So without saying more, it therefore gives me great pleasure this evening, Stuart, to ask you one last time to enlighten us all with your expertise on what we can all learn from insects. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for that welcome, Tim. Uh, well, I'm just going to get straight down to business uh, and uh, I'm going to share my screen with you if I can just figure out how to do this. Um, right, here we go. So, screen two. Well, the title may, of my talk um, may have confused you a bit. Um, why would um, why would agriculture be a Faustian bargain, and what have insects got to do with it? Uh, the story of Dr. Faustus is the classic European version of the age-old tale of the deal with the devil that goes wrong. Marlowe made an English version in the 16th century, and uh, Goethe wrote his own German classic in the 18th century, but it goes much further back than that. But Faust is a scholar who wants to know everything, and to get it, he sells something of incomparable value, his immortal soul. And he thinks that once he knows everything, he'll be able to get the better of Satan. But of course, everything goes wrong and he loses everything that he values in his life. One of the themes of this lecture is that human agriculture is a bit like that. When farming emerged in the Stone Age, it must have seemed like the answer to humanity's problems. But its success has involved humans losing many of the things that were valued before the coming of farming and we're still paying for the deal and in the end if we're not careful it'll kill us modern humans homo sapiens the species to which we belong emerged about two million years ago in africa from a long and confusing line of related great apes um, the diagram uh, on your screen here uh, shows our very complicated ancestry. I don't suppose that the history of hominid speciation is any more complicated than that of other animals and plants. It's just that we naturally want to know all about it in great detail. After all, it's our family tree. Some of our ancestors belonging to species that we wouldn't recognize as human began to live socially and to use stone tools at least as long ago as two and a half million years before now. But they definitely weren't farmers. 
For about two million years, our immediate ancestors subsisted as hunter-gatherers, living precariously on what nature could spare. Farming wasn't invented until about 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years, that's the merest blip in the time that our species has existed. Look, it's right here. The Neanderthals had already gone extinct by the time that farming was invented by humans. Animal herding and crop cultivation appeared at uh, more or less the same time. Interestingly, early agriculture also appears in the archaeological record in several different parts of the world simultaneously, suggesting that some global factor was at work, and this was probably uh, the warming climate. And uh, this panel on the left of the, your screen here um, shows our best estimates of global temperature from about 20,000 years ago to about 10,000 years ago. And you can see that over that period, there's a slow warming. Uh, the world emerges from the last glacial maximum to warm up by about four degrees centigrade. The glaciers and the ice caps melted somewhat and the sea level rose markedly, more than 100 metres. The change was gradual. Humans didn't invent farming until the end of this, uh, at a point where the temperature had reached a level quite similar to what it's been ever since, or until just recently anyway. So by planting crops and driving herds of grazing animals, humans now succeeded in transforming their lives. Perhaps they didn't finish up with cornucopian plenty, but suddenly it was possible to have a little left over at the end of each year. And it was this that allowed the population to grow. And farming spread as a successful uh, cultural trope uh, over a period of about 3,000 years from about 9,000 uh, before the common era uh, in um, the Near East, uh, spreading westwards and reaching the Atlantic coast, uh, maybe uh, 3,000 years ago. Uh, sorry, about 6,000 years ago. Um, Initially, Europe was inhabited by hunter-gatherer humans, and these people were replaced by these uh, incoming farmers. Probably this cultural replacement was just a matter of numbers. Farming, if it made it possible to support more people than did hunting or gathering, or even if it just made human populations just a little bit more stable in the face of temporary adversity, then those hunter-gatherers were done for. The need to clear the forest to make fields would have eliminated the animals and plants that they had previously hunted and gathered. So, what is farming? Why is it difficult for the natural environment? What is its essence? How come it makes such a difference? Would we recognise agriculture if it were done on another planet? In fact, come to think of it, would we recognise farming if it were going on under our very noses done by another species? I myself think it's useful to consider agriculture as an example of what ecologists call niche construction. This is an activity in which the farmer either consciously or unconsciously engineers the farmer ecosystem so that it becomes a receptive niche for a farmed crop which is then gathered and used for food. And in these images here, you can see uh, that a farmer can engineer uh, a bit of woodland to be an open environment suitable for domestic animals, suitable for cattle raising. All you have to do is chop down the trees. Cutting down woodland and turning it into fields is a huge piece of work even today with chainsaws and chipping machines. In the past, it could have been done with metal axes and saws made by blacksmiths, but can you imagine doing it with only stone tools and fire to help you? In human history, this was a huge piece of work and it went on all over the world. 
No wonder that it took 3,000 years for farmers to spread across Europe because it must have been very slow work cutting down the primeval forest. Luckily, once you've cut the trees down, uh, your domestic animals uh, will stop the trees regrowing. Similarly, on an open prairie, uh, as in uh, much of Central Asia or in North America, um, this kind of land is, is not much good to a farmer, but if you plow it, deep plow it with suitable tools, then you can grow crops of maize instead of the tough grasses that were there before. And in both cases, what you've done is to construct a new niche in which uh, the farmer and the farmer's crops and the farmer's animals can live. So here's another way to think about why farming changes the natural landscape so much. Agriculture uh, alters the flow of solar energy and, and the materials that uh, are fixed uh, by photosynthesis through the ecosystem. Essentially, all of this energy that, that's necessary to enable living things to grow, undertake metabolism and to in, reproduce, uh, it pours down generously from the sun on the planet's surface. It's captured by green plants. They use it to convert water, carbon dioxide, and a few inorganic materials into potentially edible biomass. And this is called primary production. And what farming does is to divert the flow of energy that flows up through herbivores, uh, primary predators and top predators, and it diverts this energy in a different direction. And instead, a lot of that energy goes into humans as primary consumers who eat the crops that the farmer grows. Of course, the farmer isn't entirely successful at diverting all of this energy flow. Some of it uh, is taken by other kinds of primary consumers, which we call pests. Um, but when you think about it like this, uh, it's not really surprising that there's not much room left for wild nature in intensively farmed ecosystems. These parts of the pyramid of biomass are much narrower than they would be in a non-farmed ecosystem. And that's why we see reduced biodiversity in the modern intensively farmed world. Essentially the same thing goes on in animal farming, except that instead of humans being the primary sub, um, consumers of all of this solar energy flow, it, instead it goes into our farm animals and their products and we then consume them. So now in this animal farming system, the secondary consumers are humans. And again, uh, there's a very restricted flow through um, natural uh, components of the ecosystem. This is exactly what we mean when we talk about efficient farming. Farmers like to think that they're efficient at, cons uh, at, at growing food, but if they're efficient, it means by definition that there's less room for nature. And as well as this loss of what we once valued as the patrimony of nature, a lot of people think that modern industrial agriculture is in any case unsustainable. Look at all these headlines from uh, the news media. There are serious problems with animal diseases like uh, foot and mouth, for example. Um, these are the consequence of intensive animal rearing practices. And um, another problem is uh, with the intensive use of antibiotics in a prophylactic way in animal rearing. This is known to be a strong influence on the emergence of antibiotic resistance. That alone is frightening as it may lead in time to the complete loss of those antibiotic drugs which are so essential for modern medicine and surgery. And the impact of agricultural chemicals on the land is per pervasive as, as well. Uh, we constantly seeing headlines about loss of pollinators, for example. 
all this ramping up of product of crop productivity that's taken place over the last 70 years requires ever higher levels of inorganic fertilizer application and the abstraction of more and more fresh water for irrigation so now you know what i mean when i say that agriculture was always going to be a faustian bargain um will we be able like forced hoped uh to control the beast that we've unleashed how can we even start to think about all of these problems well the second purpose of my lecture today is to alert you to the point that other animals than man practice agriculture maybe those other animals have some useful ideas insects had already invented a way of life very like farming as long ago as 50 million years uh, in the case of insects, their form of farming, just like ours, involved a fantastic proliferation of farmers at the expense of other non-farming insects. And it also benefited the farmed organisms to a similar degree. Those insects didn't farm plants or even animals. That What they farm is fungi. And anyway, who's in charge? Because these are insects and not human farmers, I think we're much more ready to consider a very interesting answer to this question of who's in charge. While acknowledging that what the insects do looks very much like farming, actually, it turns out that the whole operation is in fact a collaboration. Fungus cultivation has arisen on at least nine separate occasions during insect evolution. At a relatively unsophisticated level, there are these ambrosia beetles a kind of bark beetle that live in galleries that they excavate in fungus infected trees they carefully tend uh, special kinds of fungi as food and when they colonize a new bit of wood uh, boring their uh, channels into the bark um, they carefully take the farmed species of fungus with them there are perhaps 3,000 species of ambrosia beetle and DNA-based phylogenetic analyses indicates that these insects have taken up the, pra the practice of fungus farming on at least seven occasions. Uh, these ambrosia beetles are uh, hovering on the brink of social organization and they can cooperate a bit, but they don't go very far with this. But there are two other exceptional examples of insects farming fungi. Uh, the first of these are the fungus farming termites which dominate in the old world particularly in tropical Africa. Termites are proper social insects they're actually kind of modified cockroach. Uh, they have large colonies they have division of labor they have specialist castes and so forth. They make these enormous nests and inside them, they cultivate fungi. One particular family, the Macrotermitini, with 330 species in 11 genera, appears to have made this transition to farming on only one occasion, about 55 million years ago. And they've been markedly successful uh, in the tropical old world, but they're not present in the Americas at all. They're soil engineers and they feed their fungi on rotten wood, which they gather, take into the nest, cultivate the fungi, and then they eat the fungi. But the rosette, the agricultural show rosette for agricultural success among insects inevitably goes to these guys. These are the leaf cutting ants. These insects are symbiotically associated with just a single group of Basidiomycete fungi. That's mushroom forming fungi. And they mostly uh, cultivate a single species of fungus called Leucocoprinus gongilophora. They're members of a, a, a family called, uh, a, sorry, a, a tribe of insects called the Etini. And all of these uh, insects, all of these ants are, are symbiotically associated with fungi. And this is uh, a habit that arose at the origin of this tribe about 55 million years ago. But the leaf cutting way of life, um, which has been so fantastically successful, 
appears to have arisen when um, a smaller group of species split off from the rest of the tribe about 20 million years ago. Leaf cutters have fearsomely sharp serrated jaws very like a gardener's pruning shears and they use them for exactly the same purpose to cut through uh, plant materials and when they've cut their little bits of leaf they take them home to their enormous nests. Leaf cutters fabulously successful they're said to be responsible for about 25 percent of all of the herbivory in tropical forest ecosystems in Central and Northern South America. Effectively, they take the place of many other herbivores, including mammals. Um, so they've taken up this, the niche uh, that would otherwise be occupied by other herbivorous animals. They live in these subterranean nests which are literally fantastic they're absolutely huge they occupy areas up to 600 square meters and they can be excavated down to depths as deep as 15 meters this picture on the left from the very first publication to reveal the inside of a leaf cutter and uh, nest uh, to the world of science. It's from a mid-Victorian travelogue that I'll be talking about later in the lecture. Um, this modern picture on the right, a, a photograph from a scientific paper, um, shows an excavated nest of Atobice verica, a species that specializes on grasses. It's often called a grass cutter. And you can see this nest is absolutely enormous. These are people inside it. Uh, working with uh, spades. Each nest would, before uh, its demise, this particular nest was dead before it was excavated, would have contained millions of worker ants and they would uh, commute out from the nest every day to strip the leaves from forest trees, understory uh, crops, whatever happens to be around, uh, for up to 250 meters all around the nest and uh, they would feed literally hundreds of separate fungus garden chambers within the nest and there the ants engage in fungus cultivation cleaning of the leaves cutting them up depositing an enzyme rich fluid to initiate digestion tending and weeding the fungal mycelium removing bits of the wrong kinds of fungus and throwing them away uh, eating bits of fungus to feed themselves, um, taking them to their larvae and to the queen, and finally removing the spent leaf material and depositing it in refuse dumps. This uh, shows you some uh, more details of the excavation. It, it shows what you find when you dig down. These are the fungus gardens. Uh, there's small chambers about the size of a football uh, and each one of them is connected to all the others by these long, dark underground tunnels. The masses of ants that run up and down these tunnels presumably know which way to go from the flow of air through them because they also act as ventilation channels. And in each of these football sized chambers, uh, there's a mass of the ants garden fungus nourished by the constant inflow of cut uh, leaves. Um, the fungus grows and the ants eat it. It provides almost all of their nourishment. The workers do take an occasional sip of plant juice while they're out leaf cutting, but more than 90% of their nourishment can be shown to be from the fungus. You can do this using radio label experiments. And the queen and the growing larvae, which never leaves the nest, uh, are fed entirely on the fungus. The fungus itself, uh, uh, here's another picture of it with the ants on it, um, it is a, a pretty typical bit of fungal mycelium but if you look at these microscopic pictures here of uh, cotton blue stained uh, mycelium you see that the ends of the hyphae are swollen and they're filled with good things for the ants to eat, carbohydrates and lipids for energy, amino acids as raw materials for building proteins and nucleotides for 
uh, building DNA and RNA. Sacrificing these swollen tips, which are called gongolidium, gongolidia, uh, is the price that the fungus has to pay for cooperating as a symbiont with the ant. But of course, the fungus simultaneously gains because the ants bring it up all these mashed up leaves that it can grow on. And so the fungus doesn't have to grow outwards uh, to get nutrients from outside. The ants bring the nutrients to it. And so the fungus is able to produce more mycelium altogether than it would otherwise be able to do. And what we're seeing here is a system whereby the ants are doing something that's exactly analogous to human cattle farming. The ants here are appropriating uh, a large fraction of the primary production of the ecosystem for the exclusive use of the fungus. Here it is. Instead of eating the leaves themselves, they're feeding the leaves to a primary consumer. Instead of feeding it to an animal, they're feeding it to a fungus. But the fungus has exactly the same position in the food chain as do animal herbivores. And of course, the secondary consumers are the leaf cutting ants, occupying the same position as human farmers do when they're cultivating uh, farm animals like sheep or cows or goats. And I'll just point out today that we ourselves are currently uh, involved uh, uh, in an almost exactly similar system where we grow rather similar fungi that we then make into meatless hamburgers, uh, many of which are made of, uh, entirely of this fungal protein. The difference between the two systems is that humans don't live entirely on a single mycoprotein. They supplement it with an array of lots of other foods and the ants don't do that. They have only this single food which has to perfectly satisfy their needs. Now then, if all this ant biology uh, has seemed a bit intense to you, you may be pleased to hear that I'm going to make a quick dis digression. And so I'd like to tell you about this chap here, Thomas Belt, who was a British mining engineer, who was the first person to realise that leaf cutting ants are in fact fungus farmers. Belt, uh, who was a very good naturalist as well as uh, an engineer, traveled very widely. And in the, in the 1860s, he went to Chontales, uh, a district of Nicaragua uh, in Central America uh, to advise on gold mining. Uh, and uh, while he was there, he took the trouble uh, to see what was living uh, in the uh, tropical forest of Central America. And he wrote this book about his experiences, which was an immediate hit and has never been out of print since. Uh, there's some very nice illustrations in this book, hugely recommended by me. If you can find yourself a copy of this, go out and get one. It's very entertaining. But in that splendid book, Belt was the very first person to propose the idea that leaf cutters don't eat the plant materials they carry back to their nest, but instead derive their nutrition from fungi that grow upon the cut leaves. And in describing this, he specifically drew attention to the idea that the ants are practicing a form of agriculture. He said they are, in reality, mushroom growers and eaters. This explanation is so extraordinary and unexpected. And then he goes on to talk about it a bit more. And this is where that, that lovely diagram um, came from. Well, for amusement, I chased up uh, the history of Belt's discovery a bit. And fascinatingly, I discovered the involvement of two of the great and good of Victorian evolutionary theory, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace together with a lesser known but nevertheless very important figure, uh, Fritz Müller, uh, a German expat biologist living in southern Brazil. So Belt, as I said, was a very good naturalist and although he wasn't a member of Darwin's inner circle, uh, he did correspond with him regularly. 
And in fact, you can read their letters, as I did, in the wonderful Darwin Correspondence Project, uh, which you can uh, Google and find on the Internet very easily for yourself. Belt's book, The Naturalist in Nicaragua, was published on the 18th of December, 1873, just before Christmas. Over Christmas at his house at Down, Darwin devoured this book in just a few days. Predictably, the great man was very much interested in Belt's theory of fungus farming by insects, and he was probably the first person to grasp its evolutionary significance. And hence, on January the 1st, 1874, just a few days after reading the book, Darwin wrote this letter uh, to his friend Fritz Müller, uh, then resident at Blumenau in Santa Catarina in Brazil. And he said, I have directed to be sent to you Belt's Nicaragua, which seems to me like the best natural history book of travels ever published. Here, here. Pray look to what he says about leaf carrying ants, storing the leaves up in a mint state to generate mycelium, on which he supposes that the larvae feed. Now, could you open the stomachs of these ants and examine the contents so as to prove or disprove this remarkable hypothesis? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Why didn't he write to Belt? Well, of course, Belt was by now back at home in the north of England, so Darwin couldn't have written that letter to him. And he was very lucky to have uh, Muller as his correspondent on the spot in Brazil. Different species of leaf-cutting ants is quite a long way from Nicaragua, but actually there are plenty of leaf-cutting ants in South uh, Brazil. So Muller did exactly as he was requested. <clears throat> And he replied on the 20th of April, 1874, as the leaf cutting ants, I have always held the same view, which is proposed by Mr. Belt, viz that they feed upon the fungus growing on the leaves they carry into their nests, though I had not examined, I had not yet examined their stomachs. Now I find that the contents of the stomach are colourless, showing under the microscope some minute globules, probably the spores of the fungus. I could find no trace of vegetable tissue which might have been derived from the leaves they gather, and this, I think, confirms Mr. Belt's hypothesis. Darwin sent on this letter from Muller intact. The letter was mostly about other matters, to the editor of Nature, where it was immediately published in the same year, 1874. And as far as I know, Darwin himself never wrote about leaf cutters in his own work. But uh, this letter of Muller's to Darwin became one of the very first scientific publications uh, in a journal about leaf cutting ants. One wonders whether Darwin thought that this was a good way of provoking interest in the ant fungus symbiosis without specifically drawing attention to his own thoughts on the matter. And uh, I think it's relevant that Darwin had for some time been very concerned about his inability to see how altruism could evolve under natural selection. And he suspected, wrongly, uh, that this example, uh, that, that this uh, feeding uh, of the ants by the fungus was an example of fungal altruism. In fact, as we shall see in a minute, it's not. Uh, nevertheless, Darwin was very worried about it. And uh, you may um, be interested uh, in, in this little quote here from the origin of species. Darwin had apprehensively commented in 1859 in the first edition of the origin. Natural selection cannot possibly produce any modification in any one species uh, exclusively for the good of another species. If it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my theory. And he was very worried about this, so he kept quiet about the leaf cutting ants. Interestingly, uh, that other notable 19th century alumnus of a famous South American field trip, Alfred Russell Wallace, also read Belt's book over Christmas, immediately on its publication. And he contributed a very long book review. It, it ran to almost 3,000 words and three pages to Nature. 
Uh, and this was absolutely immediately published uh, so that his book review was dated in the 22nd of January edition of uh, issue of, of Nature. So uh, Wallace's mention of Belt's book became the very first published mention of, in of insect fungus farming. Unlike Darwin, Wallace was very grudging in his appreciation of belt and he commented we sincerely trust where are we uh, we sincerely trust that the author may soon find himself in a position to work more systematically at some of those branches of science which is uh, here touched upon uh, <laughs> very dismissive but anyway in his three pages wallace devotes only a few words which are shown here to the fungus farming hypothesis and he says um, he arrives at the conclusion that the ants do not feed on the leaves which they gather in such enormous quantities but that they use them to form beds for the growth of a minute fungus in which they and their young live you know i, I sense that wallace was a bit skeptical of belt's conclusion here and in any case uh, his failure to devote any real interest in the matter, I think tells me that uh, Wallace didn't really see fungus farming as being a problem for the theory of evolution. Well, that was how it all started. Um, what happened next? In fact, Thomas Belt died when he was only 45, just four years later on a mining trip into the United States and therefore uh, he wasn't able to investigate leaf cutter biology any further and another 18 years elapsed before the topic was taken up again but then it matured very rapidly in 1892 there were two amateur naturalists simultaneously resident in Trinidad off the coast of uh, Venezuela name of J.E. Tanner and J.H. Hart and each one of them separately reported that they'd been able to watch parasol ants at a cephalotes in the very act of eating the fungus and notice that neither Thomas Belt nor uh, Muller had claimed to have seen this but in the very same year um, uh, the fungal specialist Alfred Muller uh, shown here uh, also resident in Brazil and actually the nephew of Fritz Müller also reported the same thing and went on to describe the fungus in considerable detail but so far nobody had even mentioned the idea of a nutritional symbiosis between the ant and the fungus so it was very important that Müller uh, particularly noted that the tips of the fungal hyphae uh, in leaf cutter nests were modified into those structures that I described earlier, the gongolidia. Um, another crucial element in the story was discovered by Hermann von Ehring, uh, another uh, German expat in Brazil. Um, he was a, 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 a professor of biology. He was the first to report that virgin queen leafcutter ants leaving the nest for their mating flight carry a small piece of mycelium in a little chamber or pocket in the mouth so that the fungus is deliberately vertically transmitted to the new nest. This whole fungus farming story was actually synthesized by the Harvard professor William Morton Wheeler in a paper written in 1907 and perhaps more importantly he put it into uh, an important book called The Ants um, uh, in 1910 and uh, Wheeler by this time considered that the leaf cutters and their associated garden fungus were now proven to be true symbionts and it's evident that Wheeler considered that term true symbiont to be synonymous with mutualist and by this he meant that the shared materials produced shared rewards so here's my cartoon of uh, uh, 
this mutualism. Uh, here's the ant. Uh, I've used one particular species. It's Acromyrmex echineator, as illustrated in this picture here. Uh, this is its basidiomycete fungus. Here, by the way, I've called it Leuco agaricus. Um, uh, it's sometimes called that, uh, but it, uh, I think that the, the correct um, uh, taxonomic term is actually Leuco caprinus. Uh, but like a lot of um, fungal taxonomy, uh, it, it's just a little bit confused. But basically, we've got this opposite flow of materials and energy. The ants are bringing the leaves in and supplying it to the fungus. The fungus is turning uh, the uh, energy and material flow back into fungal material, which is eaten by the ants. And then uh, the waste products go off into the refuse pile. It's a mutualism. For such a mutualism to persist, the cost of cooperating has to be less than the gain for both of the partners. And the trick, like a clever birthday present, is to give something that's inexpensive to the donor, but of great value to the recipient. The ants can't direct, uh, they, they can't digest the, the fresh plant materials that they gather on their own. No ants are autonomously herbivorous. So for them, providing bits of plant is a gift that costs them nothing except the energy expended on going out and getting the leaves and possibly incurring additional risks of being predated or parasitized. And in return, the fungus gives a bit of itself. Now, it's true that that's potentially expensive. But remember that the supply of plant materials coming in is under the control of the ants, which are so much more mobile than the fungus that they can easily supply a superabundance of food for the fungus. And both partners obviously make a good profit, as is shown by the fact that both the ants and the fungus rapidly increase in biomass as soon as a nest has been established. And in the longer term, the nests of leaf cutting ants proliferate and these higher attine leaf cutter ants eventually come to dominate neotropical food chains. And that's evolutionary success written very large. But to go back to this idea of the Faustian bargain, perhaps the biggest conundrum associated with the evolution of leafcutter agriculture is the ability of this symbiotic mutualism between the ants and their garden fungus to resist invasion by pests, parasites and pathogens. These are examples of the pests, parasites and pathogens of human agriculture. This is a locust swarm. You know what happens there. They eat the crops. This is a parasitic plant, Striga, which uh, uh, instead of uh, producing its own nutrients, steals those of the plants uh, that it uh, sticks uh, its, um, uh, its roots into. And here is a fungal uh, pathogen of um, uh, tomatoes illustrated here. Uh, it, it's called a uh, light blight. It says it should say late blight. Late blight is, of course, uh, the fungus uh, that was responsible uh, for the disastrous 19th century uh, European and especially Irish potato famines. Um, it's well known that human agriculture is susceptible to this kind of invasion. Enormous effort and expense are dedicated by farmers trying to limit such damage. Nevertheless, uh, their efforts are actually not terribly efficacious. And many of the things that farmers do to prevent damage by pests, parasites and pathogens actually do a great deal of damage to the environment. It isn't only farming, human and veterinary medicine are similarly plagued by the difficulty of resisting parasites and disease causing organisms. As every single one of us uh, 
being at home tonight because of COVID-19 knows all too well. So here we are, pests. Are they a problem for the ants and their garden fungus? Yes. A specialist parasite of the leucocoprinus garden fungus has evolved that is only ever found in ants' nests. This is it. Uh, it's an ascomycete fungus of the genus Escovopsis. Uh, there are actually a number of different species. The taxonomy is rather uncertain uh, at present, uh, but even with different species, actually each of those species has many different local varieties. Uh, and uh, Escovopsis is a specialist necrotrophic parasite of the garden fungus uh, Leuco agaricus or Leuco caprinus, whatever you want to call it. And it's found in almost half of all nests of leaf cutting ants. Normally, it's not a problem for the ants, uh, they can manage it. But there are other challenges uh, that can arise, uh, like the weather or uh, it might be other. Um, uh, disturbance to their nests. And when these other things happen, then Escovopsis becomes a problem. And when attending ants are absent from experimental colonies, then uh, if Escovopsis is present, the garden fungus is immediately overgrown by the parasite in only one or two days. If the ants are there, that doesn't happen. When Escovopsis is experimentally introduced into nests uh, in large amount, it immediately causes very serious damage in, and in some cases it's lethal to the colony. Uh, it's behaving like a pathogen. It's been shown that Ex Escovopsis not only directly eats uh, Leucocoprinus gongoloferus itself, but it additionally secretes multiple diverse antibiotics uh, shown here in this this picture here uh, which are toxic not only to the garden fungus itself but uh, one of these toxins uh, is actually uh, uh, poisonous to the ants and some of the other antibiotics here are bactericidal and they attack other bacterial symbionts that I'm going to talk about in just a moment which the ants uh, recruit to their nests as a kind of biological control to try and get back uh, control of um, Escovopsis. So what I'm introducing you here to uh, the idea is that Wheeler's idea that you had a bilateral mutualism between uh, the ants and the fungus is a bit simplistic. It turns out that there are other actors in the drama. Escovopsis is a particularly problematic pathogen because not only does it secrete all of these different kinds of antibiotics, but each one of these antibiotic classes is present in numerous structural variants and the different variants are secreted to different extents in different uh, isolates of uh, um, the, the, the fungus. So uh, it isn't just one pathogen or pest that you're dealing with. It's a bit like all of those uh, genetic variants of COVID-19. Uh, there are actually lots of problems that you have to deal with. Well, the way that the ant fungus symbiotic partnership tackles the problem is to recruit additional members to the team. One of these is an antibiotic producing actinobacterium called Pseudonocardia. It's a filamentous bacterium with thread like cells that looks a lot like a fungus, but actually it's not. It's a bacterium. And actinobacteria are almost all antibiotic producers, and we humans use them very extensively to make antibiotics in the pharmaceutical industry. So this is a kind of biological control directed against uh, the Escovopsis pathogen. 
But as we all know, sole reliance on a single pseudonocardia-derived pseudo antibiotic as a defensive agent against Escovopsis would not be a good strategy. That strategy would be likely to be defeated in the end, either because a locally tolerated strain of the parasite would eventually evolve resistance to the antibiotic, or because the ants uh, and their nest would encounter a new strain of the parasite that was already resistant from another nest. And since leafcutter nests are very long-lived, 10 years or more, a more flexible defense plan is needed. And the most obvious way forward is for the defensive symbiont to secrete lots of different antibiotics directed against Escovopsis. And you can see some of them up here. The chemistry isn't important to our purpose this evening. You just need to notice that there are lots of them. And moreover, each one of these is actually available in lots of different structural chemical variants uh, so that there's a very large number of chemical weapons directed back to the Escovopsis, which we've already seen produces its own uh, antibacterial uh, substances. Moreover, there are other uh, actinomycete bacteria or actinobacteria uh, from the genus Streptomyces, uh, which can also be recruited from uh, the soil environment into the ant nest uh, to serve the same purpose. And some of these Streptomyces isolated from leaf cutting ant nests are also capable of producing many different structural variants of antibiotics. And these two are all directed against this pathogenic fungus. And of course, all of these chemical agents have to be tolerated by the ants themselves and also, of course, by the symbiotic fungus. Well, how is all of this regulated? Uh, do you produce them all at once, all of these chemical weapons, or uh, can they be targeted uh, and produced when necessary? Uh, can we be restrained uh, in their use? Well, a genetic mechanism that produces a large range of antibiotics has now been discovered in both Pseudonocardia and in Streptomyces associated with Acromyrmex ants. And in each of these species, the genes required to make multiple structural variants of a single antibiotic are all present in a single uh, multiple gene cluster. This is just one of these gene clusters. You can see there are loads of genes in this cluster. It needs a lot of genes to produce a lot of enzymes to make uh, an antibiotic product as complicated as this. They're all located next to each other in the genome of the actinobacterium pseudonocardia. Some of them are on the chromosome. Some of them are on plasmids. These are mobile genetic elements, much smaller than the chromosome. Uh, and uh, there are two different types of these um, gene clusters, uh, some of which make these cyclodepsid peptides like Depsigerumycin, uh, and some of them uh, make uh, these uh, other uh, related antibiotics like this. And uh, it's been uh, suggested that uh, the presence of these genes on plasmids uh, or on the chromosome is in many cases indicative that these genes are mobile. Uh, there are in fact uh, sequences at the beginning and end of each of these multiple gene clusters uh, that indicate that they can be uh, uh, transferred by horizontal gene transfer between colonies uh, between uh, different bacteria within uh, the colony, uh, as well as vertically uh, transmitted uh, between uh, successive generations of colonies uh, by uh, the uh, bacteria being 
uh, carried from um, one nest to another in the buccal uh, cavity of the queen. And you know, that isn't all. Um, Adeo Valmir Santos from uh, Richard Samuel's lab in Campos in Rio State, Brazil, uh, a lab with which I've uh, collaborated, found that a previously unknown member of the bacterial genus uh, Burkholderia can be found in a high proportion of nests of the apex leaf cutter Atta sexdens. And this microbe uh, also produces uh, an antifungal agent that inhibits the growth of a very wide range of fungi, including the pest species Escovopsis, and also uh, these uh, entomopathogenic fungi that uh, attack the host ants, and also uh, this uh, weed fungus, Verticillium, uh, that uh, would grow in the nest if it possibly could. Um, but interestingly, this uncharacterized as yet antifungal agent uh, specifically fails to inhibit the garden fungus Leucocoprinus. It is in fact a selective weed killer. And uh, this organism appears to be yet another optional member of the ant fungus symbiosis. In this case, it's not always present, but uh, it is present in more than half of the nests that were investigated of Atta sexdens. So now everything about this ant garden fungus symbiosis looks much more complicated than it did when Wheeler was writing his ant textbook in 1910. Instead of there being just two partners in the symbiosis, the leaf cutting ant and the garden fungus. We've now got loads of other microorganisms here. And moreover, the interactions between all of these members of the symbiosis are manifold and they are both mutualistic or positive or, and also antagonistic or negative. So the green arrows are all mutualist interactions. The red ones are all antagonistic interactions. Many of the antagonisms are directed against uh, the weedy uh, pathogen Escovoxis, but actually some of the antagonisms are actually directed between different members of the same mutualism. It's really hard to understand what's going on here, but it is possible that these mutually inhibitory interactions, for example, between different strains of Pseudonocardia and uh, also uh, between Pseudonocardia and other beneficial bacteria and fungi, uh, it's possible that these are actually control devices which are meant to make sure that you only have one of the antibiotic producing uh, uh, syntheses going on at any one time. So this system that was originally characterized by Wheeler as being all about mutualism actually turns out to be strongly underpinned by uh, antagonistic interactions. And you can see this if we simplify the whole thing by reducing the diagram to a set of red and green two-way interactions. The red ones are antagonisms, the green ones are mutualistic. Now all of this is really important because we need to do much better at using antibiotics in our own human-based agriculture and medicine. As this slide shows, agriculture is a, a particular problem. Uh, in the USA, four times as many antibiotics as used in farm, are used in farming as in medicine. Um, it's not quite so bad here in the UK where the use of antibiotics on the farm is about the same order as in medicine. Now, we're continually told that resistance to antibiotics can easily evolve if antibiotics are used unnecessarily. 
That is to say, we use them prophylactically against a bad thing that might happen. For this reason, we and our doctors are all continually advised never to use antibiotics prophylactically. But actually, this is what we really generally want to do with them. Preventing a disease happening in the first place seems like such a good idea that it's very frustrating that it's also such a dangerous thing to do in terms of future continued usefulness of that same antibiotic. Now, it's pretty clear that the leafcutter garden fungus symbiosis has been using antibiotics produced by the other beneficial symbionts in the partnership in a prophylactic way in agriculture for tens of millions of years. How come? The secret appears to be the simultaneous but unpredictably various use of antibiotic mixtures. The genes enclosing these antibiotics are not only highly variable between the different actinobacterium strains, but they're also variable even within the particular strains and they can continually be swapped through the exchange of gene cassettes from these multi-gene complexes encoded on transposable elements or plasmids. Now, of course, I'm not saying that we humans should start to act like ants. Ant societies are pretty weird from our own point of view. They aren't rational. They operate on autopilot from the point of view of problem solving. Their crucial innovations in uh, the social field include blind obedience to collective interest and almost complete lack of self-interest. Their caste system and the complete lack of apparent ethics are frankly appalling to our own sensibilities. But when it comes to farming, I think it's fairly obvious from what I've already said that there are indeed lessons to be learned from ants for the management of antibiotic and pesticide resistance in human agricultural and medical situations. In short, public health and productive agriculture seem to me to be best assured by encouraging genetic diversity of natural beneficial organisms. What the ants do not offer is simplicity. And you can contrast this with what we do when we simplify our agricultural ecosystems uh, into monocultures of wheat or barley or oilseed rape or whatever it is. Ants don't do simple, but they've been doing it a long time. Thanks for listening. I'd like specifically to thank my friend and former student Richard Samuels for discussions. I'd like to thank Charles Darwin for some inspiration and I'd like to thank these places just for being there and being welcoming to me. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Stuart. That has been brilliant. Stuart, I think you'd have had Darwin and Wallace sitting on the edge of their seats in rapt attention, desperate not to miss a single fact or point of interest that, uh, that you've been telling us about. This has been absolutely wonderful. And I've been scribbling notes as we've been listening to you, thinking, well, I've got at least four questions that I want to put to you, whether they're trivial or serious. But I'm sure we've got lots of questions uh, from other people. I certainly hope so. Um, and <clears throat> for all of our audience, if you do have a question that you'd like to ask, can I suggest that you uh, either tap on the chat button and type in a, a question, or if you um, unmute yourself and turn your video on, your camera on, so that we can see you. If you wave a hand, um, we might be able to see you across several screens and draw you in to ask a question. But to start off, um, we've got a question from Gabrielle Marcos, um, and who says, Stuart, do leafcutter ants have a microbiome? And if so, 
how do these bacteria cope with the antibiotics produced by the pseudonocardia? Uh, ye yes, uh, they, they certainly do have uh, a, a microbiome. And uh, what I did in my lecture was to describe the external uh, microbiome. Um, uh, that those were the organisms that are present either on the ants' body surfaces. Pseudonocardia uh, is actually uh, present on the, on the surface of uh, the Acromomex ants, or um, distributed within the fungus garden, uh, which is where you find uh, Streptomyces, uh, for example, and also uh, that Burke Holderia that I talked about. Um, uh, and I think it's okay to call it a microbiome, which we would conventionally talk about being um, contained within the animal's gut, because in fact, uh, these ants have a very uh, sort of diarrheal way of life uh, and and uh, there's a positive gale of fluid uh, running through their guts all the time a lot of the ants uh, a lot of the enzymes that the ants use uh, to fertilize the fungus garden actually originate with the fungus itself and the ants have uh, foregone uh, the genes that encode many of their own digestive enzymes and they leave the fungus to do all, all the, the garden fungus to do all of the work of digestion themselves. And so uh, everything that's inside is also outside. And as it whistles through the ant's gut, they, they try to remove the, the good things to eat, the sugars, the lipids uh, and the amino acids and the, um, uh, so on. Um, but um, uh, the, these microbes are pretty much everywhere. Um, how do they? How do the the microbiome uh, good guys, the beneficial ones, actually resist all of those uh, antibiotics? Uh, well, uh, it's a very interesting thing that actinobacteria that make a lot of antibiotics also tend to be very resistant to them. And they have a very expensive lifestyle in which they spend a lot of energy making antibiotics and also a lot of energy making uh, uh, resistance mechanisms to extrude the antibiotics or uh, to modify target sites so that they don't work on them. Uh, and uh, I didn't get time to talk about this, but uh, there's a very interesting theory that you can assemble uh, a beneficial microbiome uh, like this by forming a sort of club, a, a social club, which is very expensive to join. Uh, and you can just imagine this being a, a kind of golf club, really. And, you know, you, you get the right people to join your golf club by making it very expensive. And so the expense that uh, a, 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 an aspirant member of the the the, the mutualism has to cough up is that you're not allowed to join unless you produce antibiotics. And the, the way that the club knows that you produce antibiotics is that you have been able to survive this uh, tremendous range of antibiotics, which is already being produced. Um, but as I also mentioned, uh, some of the antibiotics are actually directed sideways at other members of the community. And I think what's going on here is uh, that those uh, members of the community that prosper, meaning to say they have the right kind of resistance, are able because they have prospered and grown in numbers to secrete a lot of their antibiotic, which then suppresses the other antibiotic producing organisms that are perhaps not doing quite so well. And in this way, some members of the beneficial community can come up 
when other members go down. And I think that this is uh, the trick to making the beneficial microbiome responsible uh, for, uh, responsive rather, to the, the possible uh, different antibiotic challenges which might arise from new um, Escovopsis pathogens. It's rather a complicated answer to a very sensible and simple question. Uh, but the fact is, we don't really know uh, actually what's going on here. Um, it, this is an incredibly active area of research. Um, I've been looking into this for some writing that I've been doing, and I found no difficulty at all uh, in tracking down more than a thousand scientific papers that have been published in the last decade. Uh, and one of the reasons that people are so interested in this very complex mutualism uh, is the idea that it's all going on outside the body. So you can actually dissect it, take it apart, and then put it back together again bit by bit. And the chemistry, of course, is really interesting and potentially uh, patentable and usable in medicine agriculture and so on. I guess that my comment uh, to that point would be that I think that actually the point here is, is not the individual antibiotics which are being uh, usefully produced here, but rather the complexity and reactivity of the system. Uh, and I think that we would do well to reflect on that uh, in our own thinking about how our medicine and agriculture ought to work. That's very interesting, Stuart. Stuart, I've got four other people that would like to ask a question. Um, taking these in order, Anthony Symes has asked, can you explain hygienic gardening? And does this mean that the ants can remove pathogenic fungi physically? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, uh, in fact, they, they seek out uh, the, the wrong kind of fungi. And it's a very good question to know uh, how mm -hmm. they recognize them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, presumably they have to educate themselves about fungus uh, tastes uh, and some of them just taste bad and they right. get rid of them that way. Uh, they also uh, have some uh, uh, glands on um, their um, on their bodies, they're called metapleural glands, uh, which actually secrete uh, a kind of de uh, detol, if you like, <laughs> uh, and they can use this uh, as a, a sterilizing fluid to, to, to get rid of uh, bact bacteria or fungi that they don't like the look of. But uh, actually, I think in the end, uh, one, what one is really looking for here is very simple mechanisms that would enable this apparently complicated system to work. And there is one very simple mechanism that the ants can use, which is that they uh, taste each bit of fungus garden that they come to. And actually, if it's not supplying much in the way of nutrients, it's probably gone wrong. And so what they do is they cut out the bits of fungus garden that don't taste nice and then they take them away to a, a rubbish tip and get rid of them uh, and by doing that they probably get rid of a lot of uh, microbes which uh, aren't doing the job. Mm. Fascinating. Now Philippe Blondel is asking could the negative effect of antibiotics on the symbiotic bacteria that produce them be some kind of population control? Uh, to avoid them overwhelming the nest and breaking the balance. Absolutely. Uh, uh, again, well, you know, I told you a minute ago that there were thousands of papers on this. Mm. And of course, I haven't been able to tell you everything I would have liked to. But um, it turns out that uh, the pseudonocardia, the principal beneficial actinobacterial symbiont, the one that secretes the good antibiotics, is actually carried by the ants in little pockets on the surface of their bodies. They're like little um, crypts mm. uh, made out of cuticle. And this enables them uh, 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 to make sure that wherever they go, 
they carry this actinobacterium with them. But the actinobacterium actually grows using uh, a, a secretion which is produced in the bottom of the crypt. And so uh, the, the ant has the, the potential here to control the growth of uh, these beneficial microbes by regulating the supply of nutrient to uh, the beneficial microbes. And uh, I do think uh, that what Philippe uh, has just suggested is, is very likely um, be, because, you know, uh, the, the doctors who tell us not to overuse antibiotics are most certainly right. If you want to delay uh, uh, the uh, a rising of antibiotic resistance, you ought not to use too much of them too often. And it may well be that what the the uh, uh, ants are able to do here is to regulate the enthusiasm of the actinobacterium and say, well, not yet. Uh, there's nothing much wrong out here. So don't you go producing your uh, antibiotic just yet. But on the other hand, perhaps when things get wrong, go wrong, uh, they're able to supply nutrients and cause those bacteria to grow more quickly. And again, thinking about this, uh, what you want is the most simple possible mechanism. You don't really want uh, to have uh, ants uh, recognizing hundreds of different possible problems. They aren't smart enough for that. Almost certainly, uh, one of the best things uh, to have regulate the growth of these antibiotic producing um, symbionts would be a stress response in the ant. So the ant sees uh, or tastes that something is going wrong in the fungus garden and it releases a stress hormone and the stress hormone then releases the growth of the relevant uh, actinobacteria. Mm, mm, that's, that's really fascinating, which very much actually leads on to our next question from Paul Taggart, where interesting one is, what sort of factors, he asks, lead to the collapse of a nest? Well, um, well, obviously, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, are uh, ecological factors. Mm -hmm. uh, it could well be that ants, uh, you know, different ant nests compete with each other. There's the possibility of uh, different species of leaf cutters, which are sometimes, uh, you know, in the same place competing with each other. But they actually occur at very high density. And it may well be that sometimes uh, they actually get so exuberant in their populations that there just aren't enough leaves. Uh, in which case you've got a problem with the food supply. Another possibility, of course, is uh, that some of these uh, ants are actually agricultural pests. They don't only eat bits of the Amazon rainforest, they eat bits of farmers' fields as well. And I dare say that the farmers sometimes come along and try and uh, block up their holes in their nests or, or excavate them or... Uh, put nasty chemicals down. Uh, th there are lots of possibilities. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the other thing, of course, is that just as humans are sometimes subject to pandemics of newly evolved pathogens, I dare say that that happens with leaf cutter ant nests as well. Well, that's very interesting because that actually follows up or leads on directly to a question from Jude Harris. Same sort of thing, but she says, you showed a slide of a dead nest being investigated, which we've just been talking about. She says, it could have been a parasitic crisis, but there is a possibility that this extinction could have happened because the ant colony eventually over time created some imbalance with the environment, which I think is very much what you've just been saying. But is there also the possibility that uh, other sort of um, aggressive ants, soldier ants for such like, could come across a nest and think, wow, look at all the goodies here. You know, we've hit pay dirt. And, you know, could that be a factor which... Yeah, absolutely. The most serious predators of ants are indeed other ants. Mm. Uh, and th this is particularly uh, uh, an issue in Central America where you have uh, army ants, uh, 
uh, which would be extremely bad news for leaf cutters. Mm -hmm. uh, the other possibility is parasitism. Uh, mm -hmm. There are uh, forid flies. Uh, there are forid flies that are specific parasites of leaf cutter ants. And interestingly enough, the 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 ants are extremely afraid of these flies. <laughs> and uh, show uh, very uh, alarming reactions to them. And uh, if there are a lot of these flies about, they'll go back home. Um, uh, I, I actually, I, I think the one thing that we're neglecting here is that the, the an, an individual ant nest, although it's very big, uh, is, um, it, it, it's not uh, immortal. Uh, it depends on the, the life uh, span of the queen, and she can only uh, survive for a certain length of time. So after a decade or so, basically the, the queen runs out of steam and the, the, the colony will die. And of course, during the period uh, following uh, the, the rundown of the queen's fertility, uh, the nest will get less and less populated and less and less well able uh, to look after itself. And one of the things that they really need to do uh, is to make sure that the refuse uh, in the fungus garden uh, chambers is properly disposed of. Uh, actually, it's known that um, a, a very good place to look for Escovopsis parasites uh, is actually in the the refuse chamber. Uh, uh, the, the, the ants will also dispose of their own dead in middens, and again, uh, this is another good place to look for Escovopsis. So, actually, the ants have to be quite um, clever ab about making sure that these uh, refuse chambers and middens uh, don't. Um, materials don't get transferred backwards. Mm. Right. Well, can I put a question to you now? Um, clearly what you're showing here is for these ants is highly successful to their cause, very much like, as you say, human farming. And I've also been thinking about farming the, the ants that farm aphids, equally yes. successful. Um, but why do you think that other species, not just insects, just haven't evolved this technique of agriculture when clearly it is so beneficial to their success? Uh, well, I, I think it, it's about two things. Uh, first of all, um, I think that you need some kind of social cooperation for successful farming. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did mention very briefly at the start of my talk that there are these uh, ambrosia beetles yeah. which make use of fungi uh, in uh, the, the galleries that they construct. Uh, there is some very primitive uh, social interaction in these uh, mm -hmm. these beetles, but but it's really not very much. And really, um, I think it, it's marginal whether we're really talking about agriculture here or not um, but you're right uh, there are plenty of aphids that appear to farm uh, sorry uh, there are plenty of, of, of um, formicine ants that appear to farm aphids and the other central thing that you need for this to work is what I would call central place foraging uh, you have to live somewhere in order uh, to take advantage of uh, farmed animals or farmed crops. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be able to defend uh, your farmed crop against marauders, freebooters. Mm -hmm. and you need the social organization because without it, uh, it it's too easy for members uh, of the same species to steal your grub. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, in game theory, it's called defection. And unless you have some means of punishing defectors, actually, you can never get off the ground with agriculture. If you think about this in, in terms of human farming, 
Uh, I, I think the the other thing that was needed besides uh, the, the crops and animals to domesticate it uh, and the appropriate climate uh, was some kind of social organization so that people who didn't do their fair share of work uh, were prevented from sharing in the benefits. Right. Stuart, what a fascinating talk you've given us. We've, uh, I think we've held our rapt attention all evening listening to just the wealth and diversity of your knowledge. So thank you very much for such a fascinating talk. Now, for everybody else, I'd like to say at this stage, just to remind you that when our lives were turned upside down by the COVID-19 pandemic, it was Stuart that kept our BLSI scientific programme running so smoothly, delivering a series of lectures and interviewing fellow scientists in other fields of expertise. And I suppose rather like the set-aside scheme that the government put in place some years ago, there will always be some perfectly productive areas of biological science that will have Stuart at the helm. Stuart, your industry and enthusiasm leave me breathless, and that's without listening your investment in other personal interests. The natural world may be declining in diversity, but the world of science has a notable champion, and this one singular, highly achieving man, i.e. you, is a premier champion of biodiversity. You are very much for BLSI, our very highly crowded Stuart Reynolds. We have to wonder, Stuart, what else you can squeeze now into your already busy life. Doubtless you have ideas, but is the time to metamorphosize, forgive me, into an even more complete or perfect state? Now, although we can't precisely know where life is going to lead you next, Stuart, but nor can we shake you by the hand or shower you in gifts and send you away festooned in all the glories that we should like to bestow on you. What we can do is everybody to unmute now and show our sincere appreciation by applauding a great scientist, an outstanding BLSI scientist. So on behalf of the BLSI, all of us, it is our pleasure to salute you, Stuart, oh. And to thank you not only for this evening, but so we're all good. Cheer for everything else that you've championed with, for the BLSI. Closer to me. Very, yeah. very much. <laughs> here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Bravo. <laughs> Look at Stuart. Yeah. Thank you very much. You, you are looking good. Like your beard. Yeah, it's Father Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> From yeah, you another. just need a head and you look like Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. oh, you realise, Stuart, that this is not actually going to be your last lecture, I hope, at the BLSI. We will be inviting you back. So, Well, thank you very much. Yeah. You're most kind. Not at all. No, you've done us great service and uh, uh, you're a hard act to follow. Thank you very much, Joe. <laughs> <laughs>